Well, that's right. We're in week three of the apocalypse for normal people. We've been on this journey to unweird, to demystify this often uh, excluded or ignored or often obsessed about into the story of the scriptures that God gave us. And I've been really encouraged the last couple weeks um, from us taking a more historical, cultural approach to understand what revelation actually is. Um, The amount of feedback that I've gotten, uh, it's been so good to my heart and soul uh, hearing like, oh, I'm just like less afraid or like it makes so much sense as we're talking about this different way of understanding revelation. So I think that is just such a beautiful thing because so many of us, uh, we have let revelation scare us to death. And we've uh, been like, oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Then you get to revelation. It's like, no more Mr. Nice Jesus. Things get weird. He gets like really cranky at the end. And it's something that we run away from. And so I've just, uh, in my own journey, in my own studies, like this has been something that just opened up my eyes and my heart um, so much, and I'm so excited to share uh, it with you. And I hope it's been helpful to you thus far. And if you missed weeks one or two, it'd be a great thing for you to go back and uh, check those out. But we've said that our approach is to understand Revelation from the eyes and the ears of the original audience that it was written to. And we've had a couple cornerstones that have guided us through the journey. One is this, that Revelation is not written primarily about the future, When we understand Revelation, it's not written primarily about something that's going to go on in the future. Revelation is not written primarily about the end of the world. And I know that's something that we need to like deconstruct and consider again because we've thought that for so long. But it's not written about the future primarily, and it's not written about the end of the world. Actually, the word apocalypse in the original language has nothing to do with the end of the world. Western Christians, we have messed this up so much that they've added some more of the definition in Webster's Dictionary. But the word apocalypse means a revealing, an unveiling of what was once hidden. My friend uh, and Bible scholar, uh, Marty Solomon, he says this about Revelation. Revelation is written to a first century church being persecuted by the Roman Empire. It's written to a people running for their lives, wondering if it's all worth it. Revelation is a message of hope. It's a message of encouragement. It's a call to stay in the game, to hold on, to persevere, no matter what is going on around us in the world. Stay in the game. Don't press eject, even though it gets hard, because Jesus is king, and he will win, and he will end evil and oppression once and for all, and we can hold on to that hope. This is what Revelation was meant to do. So shame on us when we scare people with it or we let us let it scare us because that is not the message that God has given us through the book of Revelation. The last couple of weeks, uh, we've looked at some of the bad guys of Revelation. Last week, we talked about the dragon or the devil. We talked about the beast and no, the beast is not the monster energy drink that you were afraid to drink. Just don't drink that because it's bad for you, not because of anything with Revelation. Uh, but anyway, uh, we talked about those things. Today, I want to talk about uh, another enemy that is, uh, is sneakier and it's more insidious because sometimes it lies in us and God wants us to live a different story. It's an interesting thing with Revelation. When you treat Revelation like a simple script for the future, you just sort of look towards the sky and you have your hands in your pockets and you speculate what's going on. It's like this guy trying to understand and the mystery and like a detective trying to draw all the lines together. But when we understand that Revelation is actually more than that, It challenges us to look at ourselves. We've said this throughout the series as well, that Revelation is not a simple script for the future. It's not like a play-by-play of how things are going to go down, but Revelation is a script for the church, for the followers of Jesus for all times. And the enemy that we're going to look at today is one that we like to scapegoat on other people. It's a human thing that we do. But I like to say that this enemy is the call coming from inside of the house. And it's something that Pastor John, who wrote Revelation, is going to call out and challenge us to live differently. I mean, it's really easy to uh, scapegoat other people and other things saying that they're the problem, right? I mean, we're really, really good at this. I remember, uh, man, it's been about 10 years ago now, and this is going to sound really weird, but I used to play in a little bit of a band. And what I mean by a little bit of a band is that we got paid a couple times to play some gigs. And we would be such rock stars that these churches that would hire us to lead worship at their things, uh, they would put us up in a Super 8 hotel. I mean, 
it was rock star status like you would not believe. And I remember one of the gigs, we drove like six and a half hours up to Traverse City, Michigan on a Friday after work, and uh, we're all exhausted. We get to our Super 8 with the two queen beds and four like dudes and two queen beds. That's a... It was just so rock star, so cool. Anyway, um, and I remember that night um, I had the worst sleep because somebody was snoring all night long. One of the dudes in this band was snoring all night long. But it was so frustrating because every time that I would like be woken up from their snoring, I'd be like, who is it, who is it, who is it? And the snoring would stop immediately. And I'm like, who, what joker is snoring, but as soon as I wake up to call them out, they stop snoring. And so I had the worst night of sleep. I'm mad at all the guys thinking it's a combination of all of them because I could never catch who was actually snoring. The next morning we wake up, I'm like, okay, which one of you guys was snoring all night long? And they all three looked at me like, bro, it was you all night long. I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense that every time that I woke up, the snoring stopped. I was the problem, right? And we all have experiences like that. What we're going to look at today is an enemy that we are all susceptible to, and we can't point out at other people and blame, but it's something we've got to reckon for ourselves and how we are going to follow Jesus forward. So I want to take us to Revelation chapter 18. This is near the end of John's apocalypse, and we're introduced to this strange image uh, that, honestly, it's pretty PG-13. It's, it's, it's sexually charged. It's, like, really intense. But we see this image of this enemy, and uh, I think there's so much inside of that that we can learn from and glean from today. So let's take it to Revelation chapter 18. One of the seven angels who had <clears throat> the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated or drunk with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. Like what is going on here, right? Then we are told about the woman. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. With a, and she held a golden cup in her hand, like quite the glam fit, right? For this woman here. Filled, the cup was filled with abominable things and filths of her adultery. What a description. Feels like a winner, right? And we're like thinking like, who is this? What is this going on? We continue on and John continues to reveal more in the next paragraph, the next verse here. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. I always think of like a a Mike Tyson tattoo on her face, right? It said this, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. This woman's name was Babylon. Babylon. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. We're introduced to this mysterious woman who's dressed in opulence and glamour, who's drunk off of the way that she's been able to tempt the kings of the earth to participate in her way. She's called the mother of prostitutes. (laughs) We think, in the way that we often are talking about Revelation, that any character, we're thinking in our current context, who could this woman be? Who is Babylon today? Or who could this be in the future? Who's the woman that's going to be like beautiful and she's going to have the golden cup and she's going to have that weird Mike Tyson tattoo? Like, who is that going to be, right? But remember, the way that we're interpreting Revelation is that this had to make sense to the first audience. This had to make sense to the people who read this first in the first century. And to them, they would have heard the name Babylon and their ears and their eyes and their minds and their imaginations would have perked up immediately because Babylon is an apocalyptic literature trope. It's, a, it's, it's just a figure of speech that's very common throughout all of these scriptures for the way of empire and a, a oppressive kingdom. This goes all the way back. They would call Babylon Egypt that held them in slavery. We would call the Philistines who David fought against. They would call that Babylon the Assyrians later. And then actually the Babylonians who kicked them out of Jerusalem, God's people all the way throughout the Old Testament, they called every oppressive regime, oppressive kingdom, Babylon. They would have Their ears would have perked up. They would have known exactly what was being talked about. This is not talking about a person. This is talking about a culture of empire. 
And the language of the, being the prostitute in adultery is something that's picked up in the prophet Ezekiel, where I know you guys all spent your quiet times this week, and Jeremiah talking, that was sarcastic, by the way, uh, and talking about uh, the way that they would be seduced by the way of Babylon. John is saying as a pastor to these churches in the first century that there is a spirit, a culture of empire and oppression, and that is what Babylon is. Babylon says this, the spirit, the culture of Babylon says more, more. Let's not just have a drink, let's get intoxicated. Conquest will take people over and enlarge our territory, not seeing the humanity in our enemy's eyes. Greed, we've got to have more and we'll do whatever it takes to where we have more for ourselves. Opulence, wealth, glamour, VIP status, everywhere we go, more at all costs. That is what the Babylon Babylonian spirit is. And that's Babylon the great that John is saying, stay away from. Scott McKnight, who is a PhD in New Testament studies, he's, the, uh, he's one of the great uh, professors of New Testament at Northern Seminary up in Chicago, and I love his work. He wrote about this extensively in his book, Revelation for the Rest of Us, which has been such a great resource for me and my studies in this series. But he says that Babylon is not just one kingdom, but it's actually a spirit of kingdom that's been around forever. And he traces throughout the whole scripture seven timeless factors, timeless characteristics of Babylon. And these are what they look like. We have first, we have it being an idolatrous culture to where we don't worship the one creator God, but we worship money, we worship sex, we worship ourselves, we worship growth and prosperity and all the different kind of gods that go along with it, the little idols that we worship, we're idolatrous. That's what a Babylon looks like. Opulent, loving, being hoity-toity, right? To be like uh, so glamorous, over the top, VIP, uh, to be so wealthy and to have more and more wealth for ourselves, and to show it off is what it means to be opulent. To be image driven was to care so much about our reputation and the way that we look that we don't care at all about doing good. We just want to look good and we consider ourselves. The picture is always looking in a mirror and making sure that people see us the way that we want to be seen. Militaristic, always building up weapons and weaponry so that we are protected, but in a way so we can take over anybody that we want, any time that we want. That's a spirit of um, Babylon, being militaristic. Murderous, not having a culture of life, but seeing people as uh, things that you can just destroy and not worrying or seeing the humanity in them at all. Economic exploitation is another characteristic of Babylon to where we don't care how something is made. We don't care who is involved with the making of it. We just want a cheap good and we will exploit people and make a larger gap between the working class and the ruling class. That's what it was all about in Babylon was an economic exploitation. And in many times it was all the way to slavery in the times of the Bible. Then also arrogance. We're number one. We're number one. You're number two, but it might as well be 700. Like, we are so much better. We are God's gift to the world, and everybody else stinks compared to us. That is the spirit of Babylon. And John writes about Babylon the Great. And he'll ultimately say that Babylon the Great is going down. God is bringing a new order, a new kingdom that doesn't look like this at all. But his challenge to the first century Christians, and dare I say his challenge to you and I today, is to get out of Babylon. He says this the very next verse about Babylon. He says, then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people. Get out of there. Don't participate in the way of Babylon so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. In other words, God is just and Babylon is not, and God is going to wipe out the upside down evil empires of the world ultimately, and we can hope in that. But the challenge for us is to get out of there. And I love how John encourages the people in the first century church to do this, because at the very beginning of Revelation, chapters two and three, he gets these seven messages, these seven letters from Jesus to the individual churches in the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, and he encourages them to get out of Babylon, to live differently. He meets them where they are in their cultural context and gives them a challenge to live as a counterculture, to be different in a world that all is bowing down and bending the knee to Caesar. 
He says, get out of Babylon. And I want to encourage you. So what I want to do today, there are seven letters to seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3. And so we're going to be here for about three and a half hours. We're going to go through all seven of them, but we're going to really, no, I'm kidding. Some of you guys were headed for the door in that moment. I want to take a look at two of them and see some principles that we can learn. And I want to challenge you to read the other five this week and see this challenge for us to get out of Babylon because Babylon, the spirit of empire and oppression and greed is going down. So let's take a look at the church of Smyrna and the letter written to the church of Smyrna. This is what Smyrna looks like today in modern day Turkey. This is a real place in our world. You see old Smyrna there on the forefront. Back behind is where there's been a modern city built uh, of of Smyrna today. Uh, But this is an artist's depiction of what Smyrna looked like at the time that Revelation was written by John. I mean, it was a beautiful coastal port city. I mean, it looks wealthy. It looks like the Carmel of ancient Turkey doesn't it, right? Uh, Eagleton right there is what we got in front of us. Like you see that like open air amphitheater at the bottom, right? It's no Deer Creek, but it'll do for the ancient world, I guess. But this sprawling city center called Smyrna. Now they were a wealthy community and their major expert was myrrh. You get that? Like Smyrna, they were known for myrrh. And myrrh is one of the three gifts that was given to baby Jesus uh, by the men coming from the east, right? But myrrh is actually a spice that was used for the preparation of dead bodies, to extend the uh, dead bodies to where they didn't smell. And it was something that was very, very valuable in the ancient world. And their entire economy was built on the spreading and the the sale of myrrh across the world. So much so that it even shaped the name of their community, Smyrna, which is such an interesting kind of thing. But they were so obsessed with death and extending a life beyond death that, I mean, that's what they were known for because, you know, sometimes economies shape the culture uh, so much that um, they were known for having like this obsession with making life go longer because of myrrh being their major export in this way. Also, history tells us that there was a Jewish community and a contingent inside of Smyrna that was not accepting of Gentiles. There was Jewish people, and then everybody else is a Gentile. Many of us, Gentile Christians, right? There was a Jewish contingent inside of Smyrna that would block access to the family of God because people weren't Jewish. This is not all Jewish people. This is not the picture of all Jewish people, but there was a contingency there that would block access from Gentiles from being a part of this early church in Smyrna. Um, One uh, ancient historian by the name of Apollonius, which I think if you're looking for a new name for a kid, Apollonius is probably available. Not a lot of those in class. Uh, But he referred to Smyrna's city center, like the heart of their city, as the crown of porticos. The crown of porticos. And there's imagery of crowns all over the ruins of Smyrna because they were wealthy. They were tied into the Roman Empire and their class system. And they loved being a wealthy community. So they had crowns everywhere as a way of status, as a way of saying that we're the best all over the place, right? That little arrogance thing from Babylon, it's definitely there in Smyrna. And they were wealthy and they enjoyed the benefits of having the Caesars being worshipped there and all the money that they had coming in to their town. So they're obsessed with life and and death and extending life. They're blocking out Gentiles from the church and uh, they're also known as the crown of Portico. So they have this obsession with status and wealth. All that context giving us understandings of how John is going to write to them And he's going to use their cultural context around them, and he's going to challenge them to get out of Babylon and to live a different way. Here's what is written to the letter to the church in Smyrna. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and last, talking about Jesus, who died and came to life again. Think to a culture that's obsessed with death and life and extending life. Uh, John masterfully connects the story of Jesus and his death and resurrection and says, I'm the one that you're really looking for. I'm the one who died and came to life again. He says this, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Now he's writing to a, a community that is known for their wealth, but the Christians that are there have the boot of the Roman empire on their neck and they're not being able to worship. They're not able to be a part of the economic systems of this world to buy or sell in the agoras or the marketplace. And so he's talking to people that are struggling, but John, he gives them hope. He says, I know, I see you in your poverty and your afflictions, but I want you to know that you have wealth. 
That's beyond the numbers in your bank account. You have wealth beyond what you think you can possibly see. You are wealthy in a way that goes beyond flesh and bones. He continues and says this, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, sidebar here. We should be very careful, especially as a predominantly Gentile Christian church, right? To not let an air of anti-Semitism come into this. This is not talking about the nation of Israel. This is not talking about all Jewish people. And this verse has been used to put down and to be anti-Semitic to an entire group of people. And that is not the message of this. But what John is saying is that there is a group of people who call themselves Jews, but they're not even living up to their mission as the nation of Israel, as Jews, who are supposed to be a light to the world, to be city gates to all nations, to be blessed, to be blessed and to be a blessing through Jesus. He says that you are standing opposed to the way of God, which is opening up the doors for anybody and everybody who's making a move towards Jesus. And that's why he uses harsh words and says, you're a synagogue of Satan who's opposing the way of God. There might be a little message in this for us, a challenge for us today. Are we inclusive to anyone and everyone who is making a move towards Jesus? Or are we at the door locking them out? That's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. We got a lot of ground to cover, but I think there's a challenge in there for us because I don't want to be called a synagogue of Satan. That's not the name I want on my Twitter X profile, whatever we call it now. He continues, and Jesus says this, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. This doesn't seem like good news. He's like, yeah, you're going to suffer. Domitian is still on the throne here, and it's going to be rough, and some of you are even going to be thrown into prison for 10 days. And, and there have been uh, people that have done all the gymnastics to be like, is it 10 literal days? When's that week and a half? Can I take PTO during that week and a half and not be involved there? Like, like what is going on 10 days? But we got to understand, again, apocalyptic literature, the genre we're reading, numbers are conveying meaning. It's not exact things. They're not dealing with science and math in this way. And in a Jewish understanding, 10 has a very specific meaning. When it's talking about suffering, the seven... Seven is the number of completion, of everything being whole and completed. Seven plus three, three is the number of community. When John writes that you will suffer, some of you will suffer in prison for 10 days in persecution, this is a message of hope because it's saying that, yes, your, your suffering will come to completion and you'll have, it with, you'll have a community with you. You'll have your people with you. You will not be alone and it will be finished. It will come to completion and you will have your crew alongside of you. This was a message of hope, not a message to scare us or speculate. What's the number 10? What's the number? What 10 days is that going to be? He continues and says this. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. <laughs> to a culture that's obsessed with the image of crown, Jesus says, if you want a true victor's crown, stay in the game. Don't press, eject, be faithful even to the point of death. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Again, this culture that's obsessed with death because of myrrh being their major export, he says that, man, if you stay in the game, we, we all suffer the first death, the last breath that we have. But those who stay faithful to Jesus, those who don't go the way of Babylon, but follow the way of our King Jesus and his kingdom, they will be victorious and they'll not even taste the second death, a spiritual death. The end of this life will just be the beginning of a new eternal life that can never be stamped out by anyone. What a message of hope. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. This was a letter to the church in Smyrna saying, hey, Babylon is all around you. The spirit, the culture of Babylon, of more, of opulence, of economic exploitation, uh, not a culture of life, but murderous. It's all around you, but get out of there. Live differently. Be a counterculture to it. Next, I want to take us to the letter to the church in Laodicea, which is my favorite of the seven letters. It's the last one, and there is so much going on in this that is just mind-blowing and so challenging to us today. First, I want to show you a picture of, in modern-day Turkey, where Laodicea was. Here are some of the ruins. You see the beautiful, uh, ornate columns there in Laodicea. But here is an artist's depiction of what Laodicea looked like at the time that John wrote 
Revelation. You see those big open air agoras. You see in the, the you see the amphitheater in the back there where there would be plays, and that would be another temple on the uh, the left side of the picture as well. You see a big mountainside in the background of the picture, and this is what Laodicea was, another wealthy Roman colony in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. But there's so much we need to understand about Laodicea before we look at the letter, and the things we understand culturally is going to illuminate what John is actually saying here. And this is so important for us to understand. We need to understand that in Laodicea, they had a water source issue. The water in their town of Laodicea was disgusting. It was mineral tasting. It was acidic. It was like drinking Dasani water. I just don't get it at all, but this is all that they had in Laodicea. I take Dasani and I'm like, what is this? It's terrible. Some of you guys love it and you're wrong. It's okay. I love you still. Um, The water source was terrible in Laodicea, so they had to get water from elsewhere. They were sandwiched in Laodicea between two other communities. Up on the mountainside that you saw in that picture was the community of Heropolis. And in Heropolis, there was this natural mineral hot springs that people would travel weeks to come and visit the Heropolis hot springs. It was world-renowned for its warm, soothing, healing waters. And it had this healing property, and it would just relax you. And if you were in pain, it would soothe you. It was restorative. And people would come from all over to the hot springs of Heropolis which is right outside of Laodicea. The other side of Laodicea, more in the countryside, was a community called Colossae, which we have a letter in our New Testament called Colossians that Paul wrote to a community inside of Colossae. Colossae was not known for hot water, but they had this really refreshing, amazing freshwater spring with constant cool and refreshing water. Water that would be rejuvenating when you would take a drink of it and refresh you, give you a boost of energy when you got to remember we're in the Middle East where the hot sun is coming down all all the time and there's no air conditioning. People would love the water from Colossae because it was refreshing. It was so delightful. And in Laodicea, they built a pipe system from Colossae to Laodicea for the cool water to get to Laodicea. They built a pipe system from Heropolis to get to Laodicea to get water there because their water was terrible. But by the time that the water got to Laodicea, hot water wasn't hot, cold water wasn't cold. It was just lukewarm and it was gross and nobody liked it. And I think that'll come into play as we read the letter. But the water source had so much to do with this letter. We also learned that Laodicea, they built that piping system to two different communities. It was a very wealthy community. It was a business town. They had major exports of this black wool that they shipped all across the world called Tramata. They were famous for this eye salve that people, that their eyes were just hurting from the sun. Because remember, there's no sunglasses or anything like that. And their eyesight was going bad. It would be an eye salve that would soothe their eyes. And they sold it all over the world so that people could see. And because of their wealth, it led them to be a very self-sufficient, prideful community as well. They felt like they didn't need anybody's help. So much so that in AD 60, about 30 years before Revelation was written, there was a massive uh, earthquake and Laodicea was almost pummeled completely. The Roman Empire tried to send them federal aid. Think of it like FEMA money in our country. Try to send them federal aid. But the leaders in Laodicea said, nope, we'll do it ourselves. We don't need you. And there's actually Roman coins in the city of Laodicea that say that motto for their town, we did it ourselves. Talk about pride and self-sufficiency. It sounds like my two-year-old Thomas right now says, no, myself, no, myself, buddy, you're going to die. Like you're going to break a leg and an arm. Like, no, myself, I'll do everything. And if you've got toddlers, you know what that's like, that stage, right? Just where I am right now. The I'll do it myself attitude. And not only were they self-sufficient, but this would think of Laodicea as a base town to where the Roman Empire had soldiers that were, uh, that were trained there. And there was actually a Roman imperial law that was instituted in Laodicea that any Roman soldier could barge into your house at any time and demand you to cook them a full course meal and for you to give them their hospita- your hospitality for a night. Like they could just barge in at any time and they said, I'm a Roman soldier, cook me a meal, put me up for a night, do whatever I want. Some of the introverts in the room were like running for the hills thinking like, I'm glad I don't live in Laodicea. I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared. The house is a mess, that whole thing. But this was like the culture in Laodicea that soldiers could barge in and demand you to cook for them and to put them up and to show them hospitality. Now, with all of that context about Laodicea, John knew about this community because he knows these people and he writes this message from Jesus to them. And let's let that context illuminate how John's saying, get out of Babylon, live as a counterculture. 
We see this in the letter to the church in Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I love that describe, this description of Jesus. He says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I heard 500 youth group messages <laughs> that was all about this, right? I know your deeds and I'd rather you be hot or on fire for Jesus or cold or not want to have anything to do with Jesus because you know what Jesus will do? If you're lukewarm for Jesus, he'll spit you out of his mouth. And you're like, here we go, Joel, with the like, no more nice Jesus. Like this is, sounds like really intense stuff. And it's this guilt ridden message that makes us want to do more for Jesus and modify our behavior. And that's how Jesus is going to love us. If we do this, he won't spit us out of his mouth, right? I mean, many of you guys, you've heard this, right? It's a scary kind of thing to hear. What's amazing is the more that I study, the more that I learn, like, I think we get this message completely wrong if we understand the context of this community. Remember, hot water that came from Heropolis was restorative. It was soothing. It felt good. It was healing. Cold water also had a purpose to the community of Laodicea. It was refreshing. It would give them energy, and it would give them a soothing reality from the hot sun of just that cold drink of water. <sighs> Lukewarm water just tasted terrible. It did nothing. It was useless. What if the message from Jesus to the church in Laodicea, and therefore the message to us, if we're followers of Jesus today, is not to like be hot or cold, don't be lukewarm, but be useful how are we like hot water to those around us? How do our deeds make us look and feel like hot water? How are our connections and the way that we serve people restorative to the broken places of our community and our families and our world? Is our presence healing or does our presence not do anything into those broken places? How are you and I spreading the love of Jesus to be like hot water to restore and to soothe and to heal. How are you and I, as followers of Jesus, how are we like cold water, refreshing, rejuvenating, like another shot of energy because you feel so refreshed? When we're around people, do we bring that to them? Or do we pile on more drama? Or do we not get into the weeds and we just be like, oh, that sucks for them? I think the type of church, the type of Jesus followers that Jesus is disgusted by and spits out of his mouth are just those who are just like useless. We're not in the game of being soothing, restorative. We're not being in the game of being refreshing and rejuvenating. We're just like, whatever. That's what lukewarm is actually like. So the question for us is, are we hot or cold? We should be both, right? But lukewarm does nothing. And that's the challenge that John, Jesus is laying out through John to the church of Laodicea. And that's a whole message for itself, but we got more ground to cover. He continues on the very next verse. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Remember, Laodicea had that self-sufficiency. They had that attitude of, we don't need anybody's help. And John knows this. And so he writes to them and says, like, you think that you've got it all together, but you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He says this, that the entry exam into the kingdom of God, into the flow and the rhythm of the life of God is actually humility. It's you recognizing your need and your pride is blocking entrance for you to live in rhythm with God in his kingdom. He says, you don't get it. Like your self-sufficiency is locking you out. You don't need anything. We all need the grace of God. He continues and says this, I counsel you to buy from me, to come to Jesus, gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. Real gold that's actually been through it because of life with Jesus. That's how you truly become rich. And white clothes to wear, not the black tremata that they were known for, but white pure clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Remember, they're known for that eye salve spread all over the world. And Jesus is saying, if you want to have true riches, if you want to truly be blessed, not by the standards of Babylon, of opulence and more wealth, but if you want to be truly blessed, you come to me and you get what you need from me. I'll help you see. I'll clothe you. I will give you eternal wealth. 
that nobody can take away, a stock market crash can't take away, a uh, interest rate boost cannot take away. You come to me and I will give you what you truly need that can never change. He continues and says this, to those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And so at this point, we're like, dang, Jesus, you were really coming down on these guys. Like, what are you, you're, like you're rebuking them, you're correcting them, you're disciplining them, and it feels harsh. But isn't it true that if you have kids, like you, are, you correct and you rebuke your kids more than any other kids around? Like if your kids are in a group of kids and they're all doing the same thing, who do you come down on? Who do you want to correct first, right? Like, Jack, that's not what you do. That's not what we do. You want to remind them of who they are. And this is the heart of the Father, the heart of God, correcting his church, saying, this is the way of Babylon. You guys are better than that. I, I rebuke you and I discipline you because I love you dearly. I know who you are underneath the surface. And then Jesus gives them this beautiful invitation to repent, now, we talk about the word repent a lot because it has a lot of religious baggage to it where it feels very finger-waggy, turn or burn kind of thing. But to repent is a beautiful invitation from our Heavenly Father, an opportunity for a second chance. Repent means to just simply turn around and return to him, to walk with him, to walk in his way. And Jesus is telling the church in Laodicea, oh, come on, be earnest, <laughs> Be real and just follow me. Stop following Babylon. Repent and turn and return to me. He continues and says this. Here I am. Stand at the, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You better believe that the first century audience in Laodicea would be thinking about that law that made the Roman soldiers just burst in at any moment. And we see here a contrast. Jesus doesn't barge in. But in, in some regards, Jesus is a gentleman. Your heavenly father and through Jesus, he will stand at the door and knock and he'll be there and he'll wait it out, but he's not barging in anywhere. And when he comes in, he's not gonna demand that you cook for him. We get the connotation that you're preparing the meal with him and he wants to sit at a table with you and converse with you and be in community with you in this relationship. This contrast would have given them so much hope and given them a picture of a beautiful divinity who wants to be with them and not barge in and demand, but is love incarnate. We continue on. We see this. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus is speaking, remember? Whoever has hear, ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, this is a message of hope. You guys are under persecution, and I know you're in the belly of the beast of the Roman Empire and these Roman imperial colonies, but hold on. <clears throat> you will be victorious if you stay in the game. Don't push a check. Stay in the game. Have hope. Keep following Jesus. Follow the way of king, the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Babylon. This is the challenge of these letters. And once we understand like what was actually going on in Laodicea, it brings so much light. It brings so much hope. It brings so much challenge to our daily lives, not just like a speculation about Revelation is going to tell us it's going to go like this, but we get busy in the work when we understand this. So we come back to this picture of Babylon and this spirit, this culture of empire that we are called to get out of. <laughs> And the message of the seven churches is just all these different ways of telling them, get out of Babylon, live a different way, be a counter culture. And this is the challenge for the church today as well, because Babylon is still creeping at our door. And I, I dare say that we dance to the song of Babylon without knowing it so often, the, the song of more and greed and opulence and conquest and economic exploitation. We dance to that song way too often. So this is what John is doing is saying, I want to invite you to be a counter story. And the counter story looks like this, not only for the first century church, but for us today. <clears throat> Instead of being idolatrous, just worshiping anything and everything to seek after pleasure and more for ourselves, we're called to worship Jesus in our words, but maybe even more importantly, in our actions, to understand that every purchase we make, every interaction we have with another person is a way that we worship Jesus. The way that we include and love and serve people is worship to Jesus. And that is the counter story that the church of Jesus universal is called to live. 
beyond that. Opulent, to be hoity-toity, to be VIP all the time. And, and this is challenging for us as we live in America that is the richest country, not just in the world, but in the history of the world. But instead of using our resources and our wealth on ourselves, the counterculture, the counter story that you and I are called to live in the kingdom of God is to use our wealth and our resources for others. Here's a crazy radical idea. Just because it comes to me doesn't mean it's for me to consume. Maybe it's for somebody else because there are people in need and there are people that are hurting. And that's the counter story that we're called to live is to be generous people, to use our wealth and resources for others. Beyond that, we have this, this image-driven picture of Babylon caring so much about how we look and what people say about us. The church of Jesus is called to be a counterculture that's not image-driven about ourselves, always looking in the mirror, but to be a mago day driven to see the world that every person we ever come in contact with is made in the image of God, and they matter to the heart of God, and God himself went to the cross for them. And that changes everything because we include them, we bless them, we serve them, we listen to them, we let our lives be open to them because they matter to God. And that's the counter story that we're called to live. Next, instead of being militaristic, just wanting to have more violence and more conquest and more war and building up all that we could possibly spend our money on, on more that could kill and destroy, man, Jesus followers are called to be peaceful and nonviolent to see that even an, a, an enemy on the other side of a national border, they matter to God and they have kids and spouses and any war is a tragedy. And we're not to be warmongering, but to be people that are made of peace because these people matter to God. Beyond that, murderistic and murderous. Um, this idea of like, we don't care about life, we don't value life, but the counterculture that Jesus is calling us to be that's not Babylonian is a full culture of life. And I'm not just talking about simply inside of the abortion debate in our country, just caring about the womb. But a culture of life is a culture of life from the womb to the tomb, that they all matter from the moment of conception to the last breath, and we care about them and we value life. That is the counterculture that the church of Jesus is supposed to be. Beyond that, economic exploitation, not caring about how things are made and who's in the crossfires of it. There's a difference that the church of Jesus and this counterculture of the kingdom of God is supposed to be compared to Babylon that's exploiting people is economic justice making sure that people are treated fairly, that people aren't just cogs in the system and we care about how things are made and where they're made and the way that they are put into our economy and how we spend them and how do we use them because they involve people. And so we're people that are marked by economic justice. That's the counter story. And then we have this. Instead of being a culture of Babylonian arrogance that we're number one, we're number one, you're number 700 and you don't matter. A counter story that God is calling his people to be is to be humble and to be curious, to consider other people and to wonder why they think the way that they think and to see the value in everyone because that's what Jesus did. This is the counter story that John through Revelation 2, Revelation 2 and 3 that I want you to see in these seven letters in Revelation 2 and 3, what he is saying, get out of the Babylonian way and come to the way of King Jesus. And this is the challenge and the tension that you and I still live in. Because John is saying, pick a team. Is it going to be Team Babylon? Team Empire? Team More? Team Greed? Team Not Life, but Team Death? Or is it going to be Team Jesus? Team Kingdom of God? That is this culture of life through and through. I have a couple questions I want to leave us with. First question is this, what letter would Jesus write to the church in America today? Gulp. <laughs> Jesus is writing to the church in America and saying, I want you to get out of Babylon. I want you to not play and dance to the music of the song of Babylon. What would he write to us? And because I don't want to get canceled and I don't want the church to all leave and never see you guys again, I'm not going to give you all my insights. But let me, let me, let me say this though. I love this country. I love America. I'm so grateful that I was born here and I love so much about this country and I love being an American. But dare I say that there are many times that without knowing it, we 
as Christians in America, dip our toe into the waters of Babylon. We dance to the song of Babylon without even knowing it. And I think Jesus would say, watch out, be mindful. Remember whose team you're on first. I think that's a challenge for us, but I will leave that at that. The more important question I wanna ask you where it gets personal is this. What letter would Jesus send you today? If Jesus was challenging you to live in this counterculture of the kingdom of God, to leave the way of Babylon, which I think he is, what message would he send you? What letter would he write you? Would he, would he call you a synagogue of Satan? Which sounds so harsh, but I, I want to come back to this because remember the synagogue of Satan were people that were not letting Gentiles in. They were blocking access to the grace and community of God. Are there ways that you block access to God? Maybe from the way that you treat people or the way you talk about God, the way you don't invite people into church or whatever that might look like. Would that be a message, a challenge that he would send you? Would, would Jesus challenge you and say that, be careful not to be lukewarm water. Be careful not to just be a Christian who's sitting there waiting to go to heaven, but to get busy being cool, refreshing, rejuvenating water, to get busy being hot, uh, soothing, uh, healing, uh, restorative water. Get busy in that. And he says, don't be lukewarm. Would he challenge you with that? And ultimately, would Jesus write you a letter and say that I'm, I'm standing at the door knocking, but still you, you've, you've not let him in? You've not let him in to lead your life, to be in community with you, to to start this process of changing you from the inside out, to let him be the leader and king of your life. Because remember, Jesus is a gentleman. He, he's going to knock. He's not going to barge in. But some of you need to open the door for him because that's what changes everything. What message would Jesus send you today? I pray, just like John wrote, that you would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church and to you.